Coming up for this week in computer hardware, and then there was the Ryzen 5, the best new TVs from CES. They're starting to ship. What is 80-plus certification, headphones on fire, and more? It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 406, recorded March 16th, 2017. Ryzen 5 and some sweet TVs. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twitch. And by IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. Visit itpro.tv slash twitch and use the code twitch30 for a free seven-day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account. And by BarkBox. BarkBox Paw picks the best all-natural treats and innovative toys for your dog and ships them right to your door. To receive a free month of BarkBox with your 6 or 12-month subscription and free shipping, visit getbarkbox.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. Twitch's weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most engaging, most delightful, and yes, ladies and gentlemen, most practical and occasionally completely unhinged Advice, whether we're talking about your desktop PC, your laptop, your mobile devices, your tablets. And soon we'll actually have some new tablets to review for all you Android folks out there. And actually, possibly some new uh, tablets from our friends at Apple or the people at Apple who don't really talk to us, but we still occasionally buy their products anyway. Joining us today, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ryan Shrout is in briefings at an undisclosed location in rural California. Joining us today... The ever so charming Mr. Robert Heron, my partner in crime on AV Excel, and occasionally hey. road trips. <laughs> hey, man. Occasionally. Hey, I'm taking off Saturday, so here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. You're going. You're going. Thanks for being here. Going to mom's house again? Ah, uh, that and further east to look at oh. new pixels. New pixels. Speaking of, yeah, which, I get to so hopefully get the hammer on some sets before the general public gets a hold of them. So hopefully I'll be able to squash some bugs. You've been doing a lot of that lately. We've got stuff we saw from CES, uh, from Samsung, from LG, from Sony, especially from Sony, all has either started shipping or has ship dates as of the last week or so. Yeah, just about everything now we've seen at the show back in January is either now in stores or will be in the next two, one or two weeks for most models. Uh, some of the largest size panels may not show up till much later in the year but uh generally speaking i'm seeing across the board the the premium panels from lg and samsung at least out and about mm -hmm. right now which is great premium pricing as always but give it a while <laughs> for the prices to trickle down as the supply ramps up but it is it is what it is at this point is sony's premier television actually more affordable than the sort of premier top of the line you know the wallpaper television from lg and the and the q televisions from samsung are they actually sony more reasonably priced by comparison i, I would say price so, being really vague. i would say uh -huh. your for sony's version of that panel for their oled the a1e there it's part of their xbr series that's just their best take on what to do with current oled technology they actually right. offer a large format, I think it's a 55 inch version of that panel in their pro lineup for as a, as a successor to maybe the 30 inch RGB OLED model that they use in pro production. The nice thing about Sony and if you look to value coming up though, you'll have to go back to LG and look at some of the B series and the C series that are will be out shortly. Uh, those will be the most value oriented lineups uh, for the 2017 OLEDs. And that, that will incorporate the exact same panel as is in use with the very sweet looking W series, that, that right. wallpaper model, in addition to the other lineup as well. So you're having, you're having consistent panels and chipsets in all of the new LG TVs, at least on the OLED side. And so it's a matter of just simply picking the model that's, you know, appropriate for your installation need and price. And, the longer you wait, and when those B and C series TVs come out, those will be definitely the most affordable options on that level. I think we're looking at uh, like a 65-inch Q9 
QLED 4K TV, which is the I believe the top of the line Samsung. That's at about six thousand um, dollars. That's why I'm just going to click on quality display. That that is their number one TV for this year, as far as I know. I've heard okay. no other signs of anything else sneaking out this year, unfortunately, as they've been prone to do for the last couple of years, anyway. So this year it's kind of different. What they did show at CES so far uh, appears to be the granddaddy, the Q9 in mm -hmm. particular. And the one thing I need to clarify is if they're using that new subpixel pattern that is on the Q9 with any of the other TVs, and I don't believe so. I think that's specific to the Q9 uh, for improving off-axis viewing in addition to some other cool okay. visual tricks. Um, but across the board, if you just generally compare what I saw last year and tested as mm -hmm. far as the 4K HDR premium TVs go, compared to this year, it is across the board better in terms of effectively doubling light output almost, uh, improving color representation for the way Hollywood's producing it and, and being able to represent that super accurately. And finally, delivering better performance in both bright rooms and dark rooms, uh, specifically the bright room stuff, everything from new advanced anti-reflective coatings to just improved filters on the front as well that, that just minimize uh, artifacts that were annoying. Everything from Anybody who owns one of LG's 2016 or previous OLEDs, if you looked at it in a bright room, you'd notice that that panel has a red tinge to it. Uh, it, it is colored that way. So uh, you will see that in a brightly lit room. This year, nope, it's, it's liquid black, and it looks really good in more room environments. And I'm seeing that for, for both the best LCDs and the best OLEDs this year. So, Man, that 65-inch Q9 FQLED 4K TV, $6,000. So. Wouldn't? Wouldn't doubt it. This is again. This is like you're catching the very earliest part of this wave. You will, if you are buying one of these TVs right now, you will be subjected to a few software updates and things like that in the next <laughs> month or two. Uh, I'm not prone to jump in at this point, um, but that's just me. If I needed a brand, if I needed the very best TV today, I would definitely be looking at one of these TVs uh, without a doubt. Either way, I I've seen nothing where I'm like, oh, that that is definitely the best one. There are a good handful of options right now in terms of what is the best TV out there. And it really just comes down to, you know, affordability and timing and and maybe what specific features you're looking for. But otherwise you're getting you're getting terrific HDR, wide color gamut performance, the best ever for for 2017. And it's even we creeping should. over into the pro the projector side as well, but <laughs> it gets creeping kind of slow as far as HDR goes on the projector side. I mean, we've seen some sort of mock 4K HDR systems where it's like a 1080p system that is trying to do the colors of, of, of HDR. But if you want a full 4K HDR projector, you're spending uh, – you could buy a really nice car uh, for the cost of most of the projectors that are out there that will do 4K and HDR. True, and it's, of, the light outputs, it's the light output that's the most difficult on projection. So getting getting high dynamic range – uh, with peak brightness can be difficult. However, the projectors are all, well, all the good projectors out there right now can do effective DCI color uh, out to 100% or more. So there's no color performance issue there. It's just a matter of how you're going to do HDR with just generally speaking the limited light output of a lot of projectors uh, in terms of just being able to do that in a room, in a regular projection room environment. Looking forward, you'll have things like high-end laser systems that they use in things like Dolby Cinema that will slowly migrate their way back into the consumer side at affordable levels. But you're not you're not going to see an RGB home laser projector anytime soon for anything <laughs> less than six, a solid six figures. So I, I hope I hope I'm wrong. I really do. But you're not holding your breath on that one. I, I will. No, absolutely not. <laughs> So the 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 top of the line, the premier 4K televisions are looking fantastic. The sort of second tier, which dropped like a $65,000 TV into the $2,000 level, those are looking pretty fantastic, especially compared to last year. When we're looking at, say, a, a sub-$1,000 4K television, you're still getting a really nice 1080p television with a really poor implementation of, of HDR in most cases. Uh, $4,000? So $1,000. I mean, oh, $1,000. Yeah. Zero, zero, zero. <laughs> yeah. $4,000, uh, good. $1,000, not so good <laughs> for like, HDR. That's, that's not a bad budget. Yeah, for, for value, the, the biggest issue is light output. Um, most of the TVs that, that are 4K compatible, they accept 4K HDR signaling, 60 hertz, whatever. Uh, those generally, 
they, they do color okay. Uh, most haven't, unless they're using something like a quantum dot filter or other, or an improved LED. There are some new LED technologies out there that particularly enhance reds. So they have to be doing something different. Otherwise, it's really no better than solid HD color performance with the additional resolution and very traditional levels of light output. Now, when you start stepping up into a TV that can effectively do, you know, seven, eight, 900 nits or more, and to be able to really distinguish the levels and processing of that HDR signal to, to fully realize all the detail that's possible there, that's, uh, that, 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 that's where you end up having to spend more money right now. And, and if you look at what happened last year in terms of the best models, some of the very best technology of last year has now migrated into a step or two down. So things like Samsung's Q7, Q8 exceed the performance of anything they pretty much did last year on many aspects. Uh, however, that's going to be at, at much more affordable pricing. And now they're stepping in with new technology with the Q9 to, I would assume, next year's TVs will see that incorporate as well if it proves successful. So, Ladies and gentlemen, as we often say, both here on Twitch and on uh, AVXL, it often benefits you to wait. <laughs> there is some, uh, man, I hope nobody spent $8,000 on a television last year and is now looking at something that's probably superior and significantly less. Uh, but if you did, thank you for boosting the economy. Um, Ryzen 5, boom, uh, just dropped in the wee small hours, um, all based on Zen, all unlocked, all on sale April 11th, um, starting with $169, 1400 uh, four-core, eight-thread, uh, 3.2 gigahertz base, 3.4 gigahertz boost. That's $169. The 1500X, again, four cores, eight threads, 3.5 gigahertz base, 3.7 gigahertz boost. The 1600, which is a six-core, 12-thread uh, processor, 3.2 gigahertz, uh, 3.6 gigahertz boost, $219. And the uh, premiere of the Ryzen 5, the 1600X, again, six cores, 12 thread, 3.6 gigahertz base, 4 gigahertz boost, $249. Um, all to be uh, on sale on April 11th. Uh, motherboard supplies still tight as far as uh, Ryzen chipsets go, uh, but we understand that motherboard manufacturers are building and shipping as fast as they can. We're hearing that both from AMD and from uh, motherboard manufacturers. Something uh, I'm uh, thinking about a lot since I'm in the process literally building today uh, my Ryzen 7 1800X system on an Asus uh, Pro 370 motherboard um, is that uh, you want to keep an eye out for firmware updates. In many cases, you probably haven't, you probably a it's probably a, a firmware update uh, based uh, on February for memory and compatibility and uh, uh, UFI updates. And we expect some additional ones soon, uh, in part because there is uh, evidence, well, confirmed, it's not just evidence, uh, AMD has confirmed it, that the Ryzen processors are locking on certain FMA3 workloads. And um, uh, started in the HWBot forum, uh, and certain workloads, quote, resulted in a hard lock every time it was run uh, and happened on the 1700 to the 1800X, uh, you know, default power and clock settings. This wasn't like an overclocking tweaker issue. This was like the standard settings on the motherboard. Um, it looks like that it might be a power issue, and uh, AMD says uh, a fix will be provided via motherboard firmware updates. Um, so... We'll uh, have more news on that as the information comes out. But if you are building a uh, AMD Ryzen-based system, keep an eye out for firmware updates because they should be a good thing, uh, a helpful thing. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show. Nice. Yeah, I'm excited. All about I'm the microcode updates, man. Every time <laughs> a new product comes out, always some little errata hanging out in the code somewhere. So. It, you know what? It's nice that they have this kind of scrutiny on a new part, though. That'll help a lot of people down the road. So, there's a lot of scrutiny on this part. I'm I'm excited to get this machine running and uh, and start seeing just how fast it runs. Handbrake for me. Um, that actually right there, you're looking at right there, is the announcement from AMD uh, discussing the Ryzen five CPUs and all of the information on that. So, 
Should be good. We'll be using the same motherboards as the Ryzen 7 CPUs. Um, one last thought before we uh, take a moment to thank our first sponsor. Um, uh, AMD has, this has been going on for the last week, um, basically said there is not an issue with the Windows 10 thread scheduler uh, operating properly for Zen. Uh, quote, we do not presently believe there is an issue with the scheduler adversely utilizing the logical and physical configurations of the architecture and they do not believe there's any difference uh, or, or an issue with scheduling differences between Windows 7 and Windows 10. So there's been a lot of uh, basically debate about what's causing uh, performance gaps in 1080p gaming uh, compared to or basically like single core performance uh, when comparing AMD Ryzen and Intel Core processors. A lot of uh, online... Uh, basically, there's a lot of conjecture online that it was uh, issues with the Windows 10 scheduler and that that was not properly allocating workloads uh, between the logical and physical cores of Zen. And basically, uh, you know, Ryan proved it, AMD confirms it, um, that it is not an issue with the Windows scheduler, although AMD, quote, sees multiple opportunities within the code bases of specific applications to improve how the software addresses the Zen architecture and... Uh, they are communicating that information as quickly as they can because that's going to impact, you know, you know, uh, basically all kinds of applications from desktop applications, gaming performance. A lot of things are expected to improve over time as developers get up to speed with the best coding practices for AMD's Ryzen processors, which are looking like a fantastic value in terms of if you need raw CPU performance and lots of it. Well, multiple core CPU performance. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals for less than $10 per person. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. Not all ingredients are created equal, so it's important to know where your food comes from. That's why Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. Seafood is sourced sustainably. Beef, chicken, and pork come from responsibly raised animals. Produce is sourced from farms that practice regenerative farming. By shipping the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, Blue Apron is reducing food waste, and their freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. I like that. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental United States, no weekly commitment. You only get deliveries when you want them. You can customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences. And there's a variety of new recipes each week. Or you can let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. Salmon piccata with orzo and broccoli, pork chops and miso butter with bok choy, marinated apple, vegetable chili and baked sweet potatoes with crispy tortilla strips. I feel like I'm, I'm bringing around the specials at a fancy restaurant. Spicy shrimp coconut curry with cabbage and rice. I'm in, people. Check out this week's menu and get three free meals with your first purchase and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twitch. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. Don't wait. Go to blueapron.com slash twitch. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And we want to thank them for their sponsorship of This Week in Computer Hardware. I like food. Dude, Robert, that stuff's like good. Food? I love Blue Apron. <laughs> they make it easy. Are you, are you a Blue Apron subscriber? I, a person within the household is. So I've been subjected to the... Uh, <laughs> the menu quite a few times and it's it's freaking great <laughs> i mean it's it, you know what it's nice it's uh everything it, it teaches you how to cook if you really have no clue in terms of what goes in to make something tasty and then just what are the ingredients and things like that anyway it's it's well put together easy to do and uh it really does taste good i no complaints, <laughs> no complaints. i think i might be hungry Oh, my goodness. Speaking of complaining, or not complaining in your case, GeForce T GTX 1080 Ti's out of stock worldwide. Custom models are expected to show up in two to six weeks. Uh, that's, of course, the new $700 uh, Ti Founders Edition we talked about uh, last week. Uh, you can pay a metric ton on, uh, on uh, eBay if you want. But last I checked, you're not picking up a 1080 Ti 
at MSRP anytime soon. And uh, in a not whining, the choice is yours. Pay a fortune now or pay less later. This is seeming like a theme in this episode. Uh, Google Chrome, they have a new update. They uh, they claim is going to save your laptop's battery life. And if you're the person, say, like me, with 1,100 tabs open and listening to your battery howl, um, Chrome has a gift for you. Uh, Chrome 57 is going to actually be able to uh, throttle down background tabs one by one individually by, quote, limiting the timer fire rate for background tabs using excessive power, which is pretty cool. Like every 10 seconds, it'll, it, it'll check to make sure they can be throttled. Um, but if you have a tab that has a real-time connection, like you're streaming music, it'll be left uh, alone. And Google claims that this mechanism leads to 25% fewer busy background tabs. So uh, I am down with that. Um, part of the problem was that uh, I guess in, in uh, 56, um, version 56, uh, they were actually shutting off some streaming applications in the background. And uh, in 57... Individual background tabs will be throttled, but not the ones you actually care about. So, uh, Chrome Mother. And it, anything yeah. that makes my streaming experience a little smoother, I'm down with that. <laughs> and although I found with my newer notebook that's probably less than a year old now, I just find overall the efficiency of it just seems better. Uh, I don't yeah. notice any particular browser or one application. It just seems like between the CPU and its ability to throttle way down when nothing's going on, uh, better efficiency in the displays, SSD drives, and things like that. Fewer moving parts, generally. Uh, I just, um, I'm way pleased with how good my new notebook is. Uh, ultra, ultra portable too, compared to even like my, my current workstation. So, I'm, is that running? I'm a happy that, is that running a, a Skylake processor? Uh, my old one, I believe it, or my um, my notebook is uh, what is it? Asus something or another. I'll look it up. Actually, I can. Uh, <laughs> Okay. I'm like, yeah, what is that notebook I have? I want to say it's an i5. Here, I think it's a Core i5 Skylake it. processor. One last thought from the Chromium blog is is uh, their goal long term is to be able to fully suspend uh, all background tabs and then use APIs uh, to do the work in the background so that the browser reduces its power consumption considerably, which I am down with in no uncertain terms. Man, uh, uh, Andy, six oh, gen, ahead. six gen i5. Sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> nice part. Well, it's amazing. The last two or three generations of of, of the, the Intel processors have been just fantastic in terms of continually reducing battery life. Not huge jumps in CPU performance, but battery life keeps going up, and I am down with that. Mm -hmm. One of the big treats with uh, Cobby Lake. Um, we mentioned uh, AMD releasing the Ryzen 5 uh, announcement. Those are shipping on April 11th, as we mentioned earlier. Um, there's a ton of information that, that AMD is putting up on the website, uh, including tips for building a better AMD Ryzen system, which, like I mentioned earlier, talks about updating your firmware. Um, that's going to support the Windows 10 tickless kernel uh, and will probably enhance its UFI uh, menu options, especially in the memory areas. Um, Ryzen processors... Uh, it's interesting. They officially support 1866, 2133, 2400, 267 DDR4 speeds. Um, you know, basically 1866 and 2133 if you're running four DIMMs, 2400 and 2667 if you're running two DIMMs. Um, but they, um, you know, they kind of slow you down when you're trying to run faster than 2667. Uh, they have and I quote, internally observed good results from 2933, 3200, and 3500 MT slash uh, states with 16 gigabyte kits based on Samsung BDI memory chips, uh, which include uh, Giles Evo X, G Skills Trident Z, and Corsair CMK16. I, it's a 17 letter name, but basically, if you want to try running faster memory inside of your AMD uh, uh, Ryzen 7 build, you will probably want to keep to a very short list of approved memory modules to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, also, Windows 10 high performance uh, power plan, core parking off, and you want fast frequency chain set up on that. They're also concerned that uh, some CPU temperature or frequency monitoring tools are um, creating issues uh, with uh, uh, performance. Um, so keep an eye out on that and 
Uh, the other thing is there's about a 20 degrees Celsius um, difference between what a lot of the tools for reading the temperature on the, the die are and what the actual temperature is. I would get more detailed on that, but it gets uh, uh, deep, you know. I mean, it's basically the T-control, the TCTL. Um, they're using the junction T temperature, uh, which is basically the, the point between the die and the heat spreader, quote, but it may be offset on certain CPU models so that all models on the AM4 platform have the same maximum TCTL value. Um, so basically they're trying to, to create a consistent fan policy, but the 1700X and the 1800X have a 20 degrees Celsius offset between the TCTL, the reported temperature, and the actual temperature at the junction. So basically if you're looking for the junction temperature of your processor and you're running a 1700X or an 1800X, subtract 20 degrees Celsius. So, and uh, I believe they are working fervently with uh, temperature monitoring software to uh, get that integrated in the none too distant future. Maybe want to just double check too with something like the monitor app for, that comes with your motherboard sometimes if it offers one. So just to well, just seems run to be part multiple of the tools and see. But yeah, <laughs> if it's happening to everything, then there you go. That's, uh, again, you're on the cutting edge. So yeah, but uh, as long as it's not like thermally throttling you in some way currently, and it's just simply a reporting issue, that's uh, right. hopefully the best case for it. So They are pretty concerned about the, some of the monitoring tools creating performance issues, but that's a whole... That's a whole nother long conversation that I'll I'll save for Ryan. <laughs> He'll get deeper on that more quickly because he's in the weeds on the benchmarking at this point. Hey, this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by IT Pro TV. You've earned an IT certification. You're on track for all the benefits that come with finally having those coveted letters on your resume. But unlike a a degree most IT certifications, they require at least some type of continuing education or recertification to remain valid. IT Pro TV, the best way to stay up to date with current IT certifications. IT Pro TV offers over 2,000 hours of content. More than 30 hours are added weekly. You can stream courses live and on demand worldwide. Your Chromecast, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Apple TV app, or your PC. You can basically watch IT Pro TV anywhere. Upcoming course topics include Exchange 2016, Wireshark, Certified Incident Handler, Certified Encryption Specialist, Microsoft Deployment Tools. IT Pro TV's clients include Harvard, MIT, UCSD, Stanford, and many more. So you're talking about serious institutions that provide quality education, and they turn to IT Pro TV. Some new membership levels. You can access the daily live stream and select free content with a basic free membership. The new standard membership is $57 a month or $570 a year. It includes access to on-demand course libraries, course transcripts, live chat, and the Q&A forum. The new premium membership, that's $85.70 a month or $857 a year, it includes access to all standard membership features as well as unlimited transcender practice exams premium virtual labs, access to the enterprise portal, and more. And you can download course video and audio with the annual standard and premium memberships. So if you want to be able to use them on the plane, go for the annual membership and they got you covered. For a free seven-day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash twitch and use the code twitch30. That's itpro.tv slash twitch and use the code twitch30. Get yourself educated, update your certifications, advance your education, and make more money. And we want to thank ITPro.TV for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Do you ever think about 80-plus certification? <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't buy a PSU that wasn't at least 80% efficient. I mean, well, the 80, why? I guess it's, I should say the 80-plus. It's 80 kind of a low plus, bar nowadays. It is. Um, so 80 plus products, I, I started kind of geeking out on this because we, we were talking about uh, with some friends of ours, uh, we're, we're buying a new power supply and it's a Seasonic titanium, 80 plus titanium. And not only does it have a, a 10 year warranty, um, but it has the highest level of efficiency you can get. And if you're not, if you haven't really gotten bored and geeked out on 80 plus, um, first of all, it certifies products that are 80% uh, efficient. Uh, at 20%, 50%, or 100% of rated load. They need a power factor of 0.9 or greater at 100% of load. Um, so they are more efficient. 
And but if you if you scroll down a little bit on the page, you get to the energy level certifications because it started with 80 plus, and there's 80 plus bronze, 80 plus silver, 80 plus gold, 80 plus platinum, and 80 plus titanium. And uh, you know, 80 plus starts at 80 percent efficient, right? That basically means 20 percent of the energy going into an 80 plus uh, power supply is is being turned into heat. So as you go down, 80 plus bronze is 82 percent. You know, efficient at 20 percent, 85 uh, efficient, 8 percent efficient at 50 percent, 82 percent efficient at 100 percent. And it goes all the way down to 80 plus titanium, which is 90 percent efficient at 10 percent, 92 percent efficient at 20 percent, 94 percent efficient at 50 percent and 90 percent efficient at 100 percent. You do not you, you're not going to be saving scads of money on your energy bill. You know, if you've got an 80 plus bronze uh, power supply. Um, you're not going to like be like, I'm going to save hundreds, unless you're running hundreds of machines in your house, in which case you have different problems. But uh, the uh, the 80 plus titanium, the highest grade you can get at this point, uh, and something to look about, you know, whether you're looking at PC per or hard OCP or some of the other sites that do hardware evaluations, is you know it's worth it to read an evaluation. You know, 80 plus titanium is good. 80 plus titanium and having somebody independent verify the quality uh, of the voltage coming out of that that power supply, I think, is even better. Heck um, yeah, that's a must. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I appreciate yeah. folks like Card OCP who who honestly, man, they've come up with some great methodologies for stress testing their uh, PSUs in terms of their review uh, setup. So that's one of the very first places I'll always go to just see if what I'm considering is actually listed there. And then I'll always step up as high as I can up that scale, you know, usually up to platinum. I didn't even know titanium existed. But, and specifically for that titanium, it seems like they focus more on that 10% where it's not under, where at the minimal loads, which many people are actually floating right around that 10, 20% most of the time, unless you're doing something usually GPU involved or you're encoding video or and you happen to have maybe an old school CPU that sucks a lot of power or something, but um, yeah, it's it's very rare you're loading anything above like a 500 watt CPU unless unless you know you are you have multiple hard drives, multiple graphics cards, some specific well, case. Multiple but, GPUs, I think, would be the big one. Oh, without for a most doubt, people these days. If you go to plugloadsolutions.com slash 80 plus power supplies dot ASPX rolls off the tongue. I know. Um, they actually have a list of all the officially certified uh, manufacturers and the uh, power supplies they have manufactured. Because one of the things you have to realize is anytime uh, uh, somebody who's selling power supplies goes to a different factory uh, or changes specs, they need to have it recertified. That does not always happen. So if you want to find out what's been certified from who, this is the gold-plated resource. Um, there's just... So many power supply manufacturers these days. There's no reason to get a crappy power supply. I'm just saying. Oh, and there's the platinum, 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 bronze. Man, there we go. The SSR 650, 750, and 850 TD from Seasonic. There's a short list of titanium vendors out there. Very much so. Very much so. I've but, you used know, was, almost exclusively, I think, Corsair power supply units in just about every computer I've built. And I've had... I can't think of one that's failed on me. Uh, there were a couple other, I think a modular one I tried one time. Uh, that everyone can make a modular design as well, but uh, I think it's just selecting a, a good brand. And man, and like you always, like you mentioned right at the top though, having an independent test of a particular line uh, that you're considering. Sometimes you can even apply that to other other levels within that same line. Like maybe, maybe they did the review of the 700 watt version. Ideally, they would have gotten some information about the other SKUs within that same category and be able to tell you, yeah, it's actually using the same parts, but they're just running it at a lower level or something like that. But, uh, oh, that's that's super handy. I like that. Looks like a, it's fun stuff. Yeah. I'm a big fan of their Corsair's memory and their power supply units. And I mean, yeah, personally speaking, I'm also like a big fan of Asus products, too, for motherboards and GPUs and things like that. And I I would say the num the single number one piece of hardware I have on any workstation or a computer build is that uninterrupted power supply to keep the power going to it nice and consistent because uh, that th that's always what ruins systems is is like a sa regular sags in the power or very inconsistent power over the long term those those little glitches add up and it's usually the PSU yeah. that's if you have a better PSU that will help mitigate some of that but 
just throwing a, a relatively inexpensive uninterrupted power supply in front of your system to begin with is a great way to extend any particular system, uh, especially if you're really going on value parts and things like that. Give it, give it a fighting chance. <laughs> give it some clean power. <laughs> Speaking of clean power and benchmarks, uh, Hard OCP has got a review of the Enermax Revolution Duo 700 watt power supply, which oddly enough uh, is not sort of dual or redundant, but uh, actually has two fans inside the box, two smaller fans inside the box, uh, one on the top, one on the side, which is to me kind of a bizarre layout. But uh, between that and the fact that it's running at 700 watts and not 650 or 750 uh, makes it kind of unusual in the uh, in the power supply world. Uh, decent handling on voltage. Uh, you know, the crew at Hard OCP were somewhat less than impressed with its build quality internally. Uh, but if you're looking for a uh, something a little bit different, especially with the fan layout, that would be one for you to check out. And uh, check the article if you're curious if the two fans are louder than you think they should be. Now, lately I've been considering, I almost will never look at full tower cases anymore. I'm always looking at something I can use the uh, micro ATX size in. And I am I assumed that going with, say, a higher rated power supply unit would help it generate less heat within a confined area like that as well. Uh, am I am I missing the boat on that, do you think? <laughs> or is on it, the fanless like, ones? No, not necessarily fanless, but okay. like say instead of just an 80 plus PSU, maybe go for right. gold or platinum or higher, uh, just to reduce the amount of heat it generates in terms of its conversion. So absolutely, that, that's but you okay. That that sounds logical to me, and I'm just I I want you to confirm it for me. <laughs> no, no, the, the logic <laughs> there. In theory, the in theory, the energy, the electrical energy that does not get converted into DC energy that goes into your computer basically comes out of the, the, the top of the power supply or through whatever side of the power supply has the fan in it as heat, um, yep. which is part of what makes, you know, uh, you know, Seasonic, for example, has a fanless 80 plus platinum, you know, which means there will be heat generated from that and there would be less heat generated from that if it was, uh, for example, running at the titanium level. Not much, because the difference between you know platinum and titanium. For those watching, or uh, for those watching, you see my fingers very close together. Um, for those listening, you know, put your fingers really close together. That's the difference between platinum and titanium. Um, you know, you're talking about sort of 80% at the low end for 80 plus, and then ramping up to 80 plus titanium at like 94% at peak efficiency, give or take. Um, so yes, it would definitely generate less heat. No. Now I'm staring at the the Seasonic fanless 80 plus platinum power supply again because I covet. I covet. Well, a, uh, this might be the year I have to build a new system if I want to experiment with doing ultra high def Blu-ray on PC playback. So, great excuse <laughs> to build out a whole brand new platform. So I'll be looking at PSUs if I if I choose this madness if if I continue to stay this course of uh, <laughs> oh, just not going out and buying another ultra high def player and actually using a computer for it. Do it, do no. it. You know, you know, actually, what you really <laughs> want, to, want to rip everything to your server and play it through a, you know, a simple remote control. More, more bits, more bits. That nice jump of going from like you know uh, five to nine gigabytes for a DVD to twenty-five <laughs> to fifty for a Blu-ray to what a hundred. We have recordable discs coming up that'll go over a hundred gigs. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, as cheap as storage is, you know, first of all, here. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hello, Synology. Get a bigger NAS. <laughs> yep. Or put bigger drives in your NAS. And, uh, you know, try to avoid getting up to change the Blu-ray disc or the Ultra HD disc, Ultra Blu-ray disc. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's also interesting to realize how few Blu-ray playback software... Uh, options there are at this point. Uh, just the one bundled game? with that one. drive from Pioneer. So the one. they're actually bundling <laughs> well, that's ultra. ultra high up Blu-ray playback software with that drive. So if you do that's buy cool. that for a new plat Intel platform, you'll have playback software in the box, supposedly. So I'm afraid to find out what that drive costs. Ah, it's got to be under 200 bucks. It's an optical drive. Yeah. It's got to be. It should be 50 bucks, but. 
<laughs> Although with Pioneer and a nice slot load design, I'd throw in an extra 10 for that. You know, you're so generous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even touching that one. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by BarkBox. BarkBox delivers four to six natural treats and fun toys for your dog curated around a surprise theme each month. You like surprises, don't you? Not as much as your dog does, I bet. Dogs love surprises because they have no memory. At least mine doesn't. I love feeling, but she's uh, she doesn't remember things too good. She likes the treats, though. BarkBox Paw picks the best all-natural treats and innovative toys to match your dog's unique needs, including allergies and heavy chewer preferences. Chew on the toys, not the couch. All edibles are made in USA or Canada, which makes me happy because I don't have to worry about my dog being poisoned. And 100% of their products are tested on animals, their own. I like that. BarkBox is a great way to try a variety of treats and toys from local and small businesses. For example, one of the pet places in my neighborhood has an amazing array of things. They never have them a second time. Drives me nuts. BarkBox, though, they shipped over 16 million toys and treats so far. They make their own products through their Bark & Co. brand. And if you like something in the BarkBox, you can actually get it from BarkShop.com or the BarkBox app. So if my dog likes it, I can get it over and over again from BarkShop.com. Getting started so easy. You choose your dog size, small and cute, up to 20 pounds. Just right, 20 to 50 pounds. Or big and bold, that's for the big dogs, 50 pounds and over. You choose a plan. One, six, or 12-month plans are available. And then you get your bark box. And bark boxes are shipped on the 15th of each month. If your dog doesn't like something in bark box, they'll send you something else for free. So you can cancel at any time. Shipping is free in the continental United States. Give your dog the joy of a million belly scratches. Get one month free and free shipping with your six or 12 month subscription by visiting getbarkbox.com slash twit. That's getbarkbox.com slash twit. And we want to thank BarkBox for their support. I like making my dog happy. <laughs> Aw. Aw. Uh, in the things I didn't have to worry about until this week list, um, the Australian Transport Safety Bureau has issued an, a notification, a news release, uh, that there was a battery explosion mid-flight between Beijing and Melbourne. Uh, and the photo, if you can see it in the video there, is uh, lots of smoke uh, and, uh, uh, and scary. Uh, and a young woman was, I guess, asleep. And a couple hours into the flight... Uh, heard an explosion and then felt burning uh, on her face and pulled uh, the headphones off, uh, threw them to the floor. Uh, they're sparking small amounts of fire, and uh, the flight attendants basically dropped a bucket of water on them. Uh, oh. Then put the headphones in the bucket of Jeez, water and what left are they them in thinking? the back of the plane. Well, you know, uh, it's probably there's not a whole panic. lot of options for straight up panic. Out of fire. That's what that was. So. They should have well, a, a chemical extinguisher or something on board. No, I can I, generally I can, speaking, I, I don't think you're supposed to throw water on lithium fires. But <laughs> however, I, did they? I they didn't mention what brand this headphone was, did they? No. Uh, and I'm I, and I'm was, willing to bet were these some like sketched out things she picked up maybe when she was traveling overseas. <laughs> we hope it, it was a great deal. <laughs> oh, I'm happy she's not. You know severely yeah. injured but yeah well apparently um apparently you wouldn't have that happen with a regular pair of earbuds <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it could happen with your phone right well it's it's you know one i agree i i i i, I wish they'd released the manufacturer the or maybe they couldn't because apparently the the battery door and the battery like melted through the carpet on the airplane and the awesome, you know, the, apparently the interior of the plane basically smelled like burnt plastic and burnt hair for the duration of the flight, which is about as awful uh, as you can get on a 14 or 16 hour flight. Um, oh, no, there's far worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The smell um, of burning plastic is sometimes acceptable compared to other things I've had to sit next to. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. When encountering a fire with. Uh, no, now up at Battery University, it says, with encountering a fire with a lithium metal battery, only use a Class D fire extinguisher. Um, a large lithium ion fire, such as an electric vehicle, may need to burn out as water is ineffective. Water with copper material can be used, but this may not be available and is costly for fire halls. 
Yeah, you uh, think of one of the most fire risky areas in the world is the inside of a cockpit of a plane. You think if anybody yes. would have some decent training after all of these battery scares of every hotel in the world putting notes down for the for the Samsung Note 7 in your room. It's like, oh, did, did you bring that to the airport? Oh, goodbye. <laughs> Uh, you think they would be so on top of this that they would be like, oh, grab the cat class D or whatever extinguisher to well, you don't you don't want to you don't want to you don't want to. The thing is, though, right? If have you ever been in a small enclosed place with a like an ABC dry chemical fire extinguisher? It's nice because I had somebody. Yeah, I had somebody set one off inside the cab of my truck once. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sucks. not gonna. Oh, it was awful because you know, uh, and it was a miracle. We were stopped at that point, which I'm grateful for, because when you let off, you know, a dry chemical fire extinguisher, it's giant plumes of incredibly dense dust, right? And in, in the case of this one, it was a very, very dark sort of silvery grayish color. Um, and to have that inside the, I can see why they probably use the water. Um, baking soda is actually really good for putting out lithium yeah. battery fires. Um, you know, uh, batteryuniversity.com is a great list. Foam extinguisher, CO2, ABC dry chemical, powdered graphite, copper powder, or soda, sodium carbonates. So, uh, there you go. Uh, yeah. So I think maybe every plane should have that big Costco size bag of baking soda. Uh, or they should have there. something for a ba battery fire kits. Plain yeah. and simple. And I, I, I had a client unnamed one time shoot off a uh, extinguisher running down the hallway in a hotel room. Yeah. Uh, you usually will leave footprints leading right to your room if you do that. So uh, I found that pretty amusing, actually. It's like, <laughs> so who blew off the fire extinguisher? <laughs> Oops. Let's go find it right. Into the <laughs> uh, I so, guess anyway. I, it occurs to me that baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. Uh, mm -hmm. And washing soda is sodium carbonate. But I've, I've been very successful putting out fires with baking soda. And remember, kids, never throw water on a grease fire. That would be bad. Yes. I like the fire effect. <laughs> the fire effect is good. So uh, something, you know, we also actually, the other horrible battery, uh, the Mayan battery thing this week was that they had uh, uh, the first fatality from a hoverboard uh, battery uh, exploding or burning. Uh, hoverboard battery burned, lit the house on fire, and a small child was killed in that. So take your battery charging yeah. serious, people. And if, if the Consumer Product Safety Commission you know, does a recall, if the manufacturer does a recall, do us a favor. Send it back <laughs> before somebody gets injured. Just send Or, it. you know... I doubt very many of these hoverboards are UL listed. They're pro they probably have some of the cheapest ways of getting anything electrically certified generally. So, yeah. Assuming and, it's and you're dealing with certified at all. And lithium batteries are, are very unstable generally. They require special charging and special packaging. And, and you yeah. know, it's a great technology, but let's, let's hope uh, – Who's the new professor who just launched? Uh, I guess he was one of co-inventors of lithium-ion technology. It's good enough, I swear, is his last name, and uh, <laughs> and he just came up with a new solid-state lithium technology using glass, and that's something I am really looking forward to. This would eliminate a lot of the the cracking and other errors that can occur within that structure that trigger uncontrolled burning and things like that. So, yeah, and the good and though he's basically saying it's a it. solid-state battery. And that the um, I just loved his last name. I kept reading it, going, "Is that is that like is it just good enough?" Or it, it, it took me a minute to realize it was actually his last name in the article. So I tend to think good and no, but I like I like the good enough angle. That's pretty awesome. Okay, actually. that's true. It's probably good and no. Sorry. The, uh, <laughs> no, no, but it's uh, where is it? Where is it? Rather than using liquid electrolytes, the solid state battery uses glass electrolytes and an alkaline yeah. metal anode which could be made of lithium, sodium, or potassium. It increases the energy density of the cathode and makes the battery very resilient, with the team taking it through 1,200 recharges without loss of performance. Let me say that again. 1,200 recharges without loss of performance. Now, about 1,000 in a typical lithium-ion battery is where you're pretty much starting to give up on it. Um, can it operate down to negative 20 degrees Celsius? The chemistry is simple. Uh, That's and, the key right there. And yeah. just... Uh, uh, Solid state, literally something, something being able to embed that in a glass like material seems like a great way to do it. So let's just hope so, that this isn't something 
that's way down the road. This sounds like they've been working on this a while, and it looks like it's about to be commercialized. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have some really cool new batteries uh, to really compete with just the, the, the ubiquitous, you know, lithium ion or, yeah. you know, even well, going gets, back like alkalines and metal hydrides and other things. So nickel metal nice hydride have battery it. technology. I love to hate. I hate. That I, I, I still love lead acid. You know, there's some great <laughs> applications for that too, especially in charging. And you can recycle and pretty much the entire thing. It is, oh it is not horrible. It's properly handled. Battery developed by uh, Cockrell School Senior Research Fellow Maria Helena Braga, who worked with Goodno on the project. So you can substitute sodium, which is cheap for lithium. And in theory, the battery shouldn't catch fire. So that's good. So Heck yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping this uh, comes to fruition in the near future rather than later. One last thought before we go. Google may have a third device in the works codenamed Tymon, bigger than the Pixel XL. That's pretty much all we know. But uh, musky, walleye, Tymon, and uh, we uh, don't really know a lot about it above and beyond that. So... You know, I'm really anticipating the Galaxy 8 phone, but at this point, I really want a pure Android experience. I'm sick mm -hmm. of replacing my launchers every time and, <laughs> and fully customizing Samsung phones to get them back to something like Android. So right. that's what draws me to Pixel probably the most. And I might not like everything about the hardware, but it, it's definitely good enough. Oh, it's got a great camera, supposedly, and other features too, but... I, I am just, I'm really tired of the random ass launchers where there should always be an app option on every Android phone to just make it pure Android. It, it, if you want nice. to add your own launchers and other customizations as an option to enable, so be it. But it's just, uh, I, I kind of miss my old Galaxy S3 sometimes because that thing was so rootable and clean up and, you know, you could customize that 10 different ways. And alas, it is, alas. It has seen better days. <laughs> Man, you can join the wait list for the Pixel. Pixel I, uh, five inch display Pixel out of stock. Five point five inch Pixel XL both out of stock. All versions out of stock on the Google on the Assistant Google too has just shocked me in terms of its usefulness. Uh, just traveling, I, I find that Google uh, either with now and now with Assistant, it would give me updates to flights and travel well before any of the actual agencies I'm dealing with would get that information to me. And then it's like, you can do natural language queries. It's like, oh, what, what about the flight after that? It would pull it right up. And, you know, granted, it's a lot of machine learning and other things going on in the back end to make that all happen. But it seems pretty effective. It was really, really easy to use. And it just beats any experience I've had in terms of like trying to use Siri or other other voice communication things before. That's one area I think Google does a really good job in. And and you don't need a new Pixel phone to experience things like Google Now or, or now the Assistant. You can just simply add those as apps. I believe they're available on most of the most of the phones that have been out at least for the last year. You can download that and add it. In addition to other launchers, if you're sick of your launcher that your phone came with, <laughs> they're out there the good ones to try. Are you suffering the heartbreak of terrible interface and useless launchers on your Android device? Oh, that's oh. another thing. Uh, Samsung says uh, they're going to basically, for all unlocked Android, uh, the Galaxy devices, they are going to release uh, updates directly. Thank so that, that announcement came out this week. Because that is the current problem I have. I have a Galaxy 7 that apparently has been updated somewhere in the world for Android 7, but it hasn't pushed through my provider yet directly to me. And judging by everything I read online, that phone is still not nearly as rootable, if at all, compared to things like older phone designs. So they really tighten these phones down. They really don't want you just doing what you want to it. So unfortunately, yeah. I think. At least because they have a respect. superior experience that they want you yeah. to experience, whether you want to or not. Yeah, I'm down with the pure Android. It's a good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, I bet you're curious, where can we find more of Mr. Robert Heron's musing on televisions, home theater, and more? You may find me on the Twitter <laughs> at Robert Heron, or you can hit me up on my website at, uh, at heronfidelity.com. <laughs> actually, I keep wanting to say at. I have no idea why. Oh, uh, it's actually, the, I, have some it's new, Twitter thing. I have some new details, too, about all the current TVs coming out. I'll be updating the articles on there. 
And I need to take a look at what the current sale prices are for the new gear as well. Uh, there's probably, a, I want to say, five new ultra high def Blu-ray players with Dolby Vision support coming out. Uh, all the new TVs are pretty much out at this point. Uh, we're waiting on a couple of the low cost 4K laser projectors. Uh, any laser projector that is just almost all of them that are just simply creating a pure white light with a single blue laser, you're very rarely ever going to see one of those be able to do DCI color to, right. you know, into, into the high 90s. Uh, most of those are good for HD color. And and the one thing I've seen come up recently that comes as close to having true RGB lasers uh, is using a red and a blue laser, like the demonstration we saw at CES with Hisense and their new dual color laser system they showed with a 4K projector that was doing close to Rec 2020 color. Ooh. And the only other example of that you, I've seen today is from Christie Digital. They have a line of projectors currently available that incorporate that similar dual color technology. and. And to have both of those wavelengths, the uh, the red and the blue, to be able to really nail those at super saturated points, and then probably using a filtering system to get the green or maybe a, probably a phosphor, maybe uh, one of the blue layers is driving that. That is the best color I've seen short of that full RGB laser setup that seems to be just at the ultra premium, usually reserved for commercial cinema. So. Uh, we're going to have some great laser projectors this year at affordable prices. I just don't – the color performance is really where I'll be focusing the most. I think they've got the imaging down. I think uh, video processing is fine. I think anybody can do great HD color nowadays, a Blu-ray color. Uh, but getting into that ultra high def with the uh, high dynamic range content and specifically the wide color palette, um, doing that right with a solid state light system is uh, really where I'm – Probably the most interested this year in terms of displays on the projector side. Also, the, the folks who do those RGB LED systems, if they can get those bright enough, they can they can really optimize that for a very good color uh, presentation as well. I, I've seen some of the very best results with that. But generally, the lasers can do better illumination in terms of just efficiency for the given heat envelope or whatever they have to deal with for that package. But I'm really hoping we'll see some super bright LED projectors as well this year because those are also considered a solid state device. You can do that very fast switching to get good contrast in addition to things like that that solid color performance where you really have a saturated palette to work from, either to crank it down to regular HD or to blow it out to you know UHD. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be a good year for the shiny pixels. You can find Robert Heron and I on a little podcast we do called AVXL at avxl.com. I'm usually at techthing.com. And our regular host, Mr. Ryan Shrout, is at pcper.com, and he should be back next week. He is in the midst of travel and mayhem involving briefings from big companies with products I bet you'll be excited to hear about. With that, ladies and gentlemen, twit.tv slash twitch. Find all of our older episodes and information on how to subscribe. And uh, hey, I want to thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, and I am Robert Herrick. Catch you next week. Thanks for watching. <laughs>